Hi devs, I'm Mitko and this is Forever. In our previous video, we went over the basics of level generation in Forever and constructed a random level using segments. In this tutorial, we're going to go over player behavior and gameplay logic. Last time we created the level generator object with the level generator component, created some level segments and assigned them inside the level window here. We created an entry segment, two randomized terrain segments and a turn segment of custom type, which we're not currently using. You can see that the sequence is disabled. Moving over to the level generator component, I have set the type to infinite and the maximum segments to 6. So this is what I have when I press play. Now that's great, but looking at the game, it's a little bit static. Nothing's happening, we don't have a player and it's basically not a game, nor a work of art at this state. So let's get to work and see what we can do about it. Going back to the scene, I'm going to create a new object, which is a cube, and position it at the origin. Now Forever offers a couple of behaviors that are going to let you traverse the levels, switch lanes and generally notify the level generator of your existence. Which is crucial because the level generator needs to know when to generate more segments. So I'm going to go over to the inspector, click add component, go to Dream Tech, Forever, Gameplay. And here we can see four scripts that we can use. The first is the basic runner, custom lane runner, lane runner and projected player. You might remember that last time I attached the projected player component to an object in order to notify the level generator of the player's existence so that we can see how the generation goes. But this time we're going to first focus on the runners. The runner component's sole purpose is to traverse the levels. Attaching a basic runner component to the object and clicking play is going to give us a working player. There we go. Now right now the player moves really slowly. So let's see what we can do about it. First of all, we have follow speed. This is the speed that the player is going to traverse the level with. It is by default set to 1 and I'm going to set it to 10. Then we have the follow checkbox. This is kind of like the enable checkbox here. If follow is switched off, the follow logic is not going to be executed. So in our case we need to make sure that it's turned on. Now is player is very important. Only one runner component in the scene must have the is player option checked and this is the player object. What this player is going to do is it's going to notify the level generator that this current runner has entered a segment when that happens, so that the level generator knows when it should generate new segments and destroy old ones. And because this is going to be our player, I'm going to leave this to on. Now update mode basically defines which method we are going to use in order to update the player. Update, fixed update and late update. I'm going to leave it to update right now but later we are going to switch to fixed update as we are going to move on to physics driven players. The physics mode defines how the follow result is going to be applied to the object. Right now it's set to transform. If I try to set it to rigid body, I will get a runtime error because right now we don't have a rigid body attached to the cube. But if you need to have physics interactions in your levels, then having the update mode set to fixed update and the physics mode set to rigid body is the way to go. Motion. Well, this is where the entire magic happens. The motion module controls how motion is applied to the existing object. When apply motion is toggled, the motion module is going to try to apply position along the x, y and z axis separately. It is going to apply an offset and it is going to do the same for the rotation and if we want for the scale too. If apply motion is turned off, the runner is still going to work and it is still going to traverse the path but this is not going to be reflected in the object's transform. You can do this if you wish to apply the transform in your own script. The runner outputs a result object which contains information about the current traversal, so you will know where to position the runner and at what percent it is along the splines. Now apply motion needs to be toggled because we want to apply the motion to this object in particular. And we are also leaving rotation on and position on. Now I'd like to shape up the player a bit to make it look like a human figure or something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out one of the segments and then I'm going to get the player and position it inside the segment so we can see how it compares to it. And right now I can see it, that the cube is quite small. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scale up the cube a little bit and then scale it even more along the Y axis. I'm going to add another cube just for the visuals. I will remove the box collider from it and make it a little bit bigger so it looks like a head or something. Now let's make a new material. and attach it to the player. There we go. Now we have the shape of the player. We can remove the terrain object. And by the way, keep in mind that having level segments 
inside the scene when it plays is going to cause an error. So if you have any level segment objects inside the scene, either turn them off or delete them. Let's put the player back at zero and hit play. Now there is an issue. You can see that the player clips through the ground. And this is because the player center is here. And the follower snaps to the center and follows the generated path exactly. The way to fix this is by going inside the motion panel and inside the position offset increasing the Y. There we go. So we need an offset of about 1.5. So I'm going to copy that value, hit play, expand the motion and paste it. Now let's get the camera and put it behind the player. I'm going to parent it to the cube. We can see that our player is moving. Well, maybe the camera needs to be a little bit further away. Okay, that's great, but what's next? Well, first of all, I'm going to increase the speed a little bit more. And now we would like to add some controls. Now, there are many ways to add controls to this player. One of the ways is by modifying the offset property by a script. So if you want to move sideways, you would modify the X position. And by the way, this offset is always local to the spline path. It is not a world offset. So right would be always right in relation to the path. And so basically, if we want to switch lanes, we would need to modify this X value here so that the player does something like this. Okay, that's great, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to actually delete this component and replace it with another one called the lane runner component. You can see that the lane runner is actually quite similar to the runner, has the same options, but it also introduces a couple of new options here. This is because the lane runner derives from the runner component and its purpose is to make it easier to create a lane player. How easy? Well, let's go over the steps to configure it and find out. First of all, the lane player needs to know how many lanes we are going to have in our game. The standard is 3, so by default the lane count is going to be set to 3, but you can set it to any number starting from 1. I'm going to leave this to 3 for the video. Now the start lane is the lane you start in, the first lane would be the left lane, the second lane would be the middle lane, and the third lane would be the right lane. We're going to stay in the middle lane. The width is the total width of all lanes. Right now we have a width of 5. And since we're working on a bigger scale here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this width to 40. The lane switch speed is the speed that the player switches between lanes. I'm going to leave it to the default value. Use custom paths. We're not going to go over this right now, but we're going to come back for it later in another video. And the lane switch speed curve is very important to be set. You can set it to a linear one, or as I like to do, set it to an ease in, ease out curve. Now the lane vector is the direction of the lanes and it is relative to the spline once again. So a lane vector of 1, 0 means that we'll have a horizontal lane. And a lane vector of 0, 1 will create a vertical lane. Let's make it a horizontal one though. Again, we have the motion and the start mode. Oh, this is something I didn't cover. The start mode defines how the player finds its start position along the level. By default, it's set to percent. And the percent goes from 0 to 1. 0 being the beginning of the level and 1 being the end of the generated level so far. You can set it to distance and set an offset in world units. Like for example, I'm going to set a distance of 50. And when this player starts, it is going to be positioned 50 units away along the spline. Finally, project is going to attempt to find the closest point in the level in relation to the player and position the player there. But I'm going to leave the start mode to distance. Now let's play and pause immediately. First of all, nothing happens because the level hasn't been generated yet. I'm going to keep clicking the forward button. You can see that the first segment already generated. And as new segments generate, the level begins to be built. As soon as we're done generating, our player is going to get positioned. And it got positioned exactly 50 units away along the spline. Unpausing we are going to sh is going to show us that I forgot to set the follow speed and also the offset inside the motion to 1.5. Now how do we make the player switch lanes? Well for this we're going to have to write a little bit of code, but don't worry it's nothing complicated. Right click inside the project tab, create C sharp script and let's call it tutorial player in this case. Okay, so first things first, in order to use any of Forever's code, we need to include the Forever namespace. So we need to type using DreamTech Forever. This is going to give us access to all the runner components, as well as the level generator, level segments, and everything inside Forever. So let's go down here and create a variable which will hold our lane runner. Inside start, we're going to get a reference to the runner. 
And before we do anything else, I'm going to minimize Visual Studio. Go to the cube, rename it to player, and attach the tutorial player script to it. Now, as soon as the game starts, the tutorial player script is going to get a reference to the lane runner component. So how do we make the runner change lanes? Well, it's very simple. We need to listen for input inside update. I'm going to make it work with the arrow keys, so I'm going to write If the left arrow is pressed once, then we are going to change the lane of the runner. Changing the lane is done by just changing the lane property. So runner lane minus minus. This will subtract one from the runner lane and we're going to do the opposite for the right arrow. And this is it. This is all the code we needed to make the player work. So let's compile and see how it works. There we go. Our player is successfully switching lanes and I'd say that it moves a little bit way too much. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reduce the player's lane width to 30. And modifying the curve of the lane switch speed will give us different switching behavior. So for example, this one is going to start off slowly and then it is going to switch really fast. So let's set the right tangent to weight it and move it a little bit even more to exaggerate the effect and uh, set the lane switch speed to maybe 4. Let's check it out. This is going to look weird. There we go. Or we can do the opposite. This one looks better. A lot more responsive. I think we can use this. So let's copy the lane runner's properties and paste them once the game is over to preserve what we have set. And now let's move over to how we can add physics to this. Well, the first thing of course would be to add a rigid body. So. Let's add the rigid body. Then like I mentioned, it is a good practice to switch to fixed update and the physics mode to rigid body. Now if I play, nothing is going to quite change. But check this out. I can go inside a motion and disable the position along the Y. Now we can make our player jump. What I'll do now is go inside the tutorial player and add logic for jumping. So this logic is very simple and it is not going to check for whether or not the player hits the ground. It is only going to check if the space key is pressed down. Now we need a way to add force to the rigid body, and you've probably done this before. Let's get a reference to the rigid body. Let's create a new public field called jump force. Set it to something modest, let's say 10. RB, add force. Vector tree up, multiplied by jump force. And the force mode is going to set, be set to impulse. Let's see how this plays out. Okay, I can see that the rigid body already interacts with the terrain. And if I press space, our player jumps, yay! And I can still switch lanes. Okay, that's great, but jump is a little bit slow. So what I can do is add a constant force, set it to minus 50 and set the jump force to 20. Let's say if this speeds up things. I fell through the ground, that's, that's normal because our player now falls quite fast and since we're not applying position along the y-axis, our player needs to be positioned a little bit higher. Okay, there we go. This looks much better. I had to reduce the force to minus 30 otherwise the player kept falling through the ground. Now let's find a way to stop the game as soon as we hit something that we're not supposed to. First of all, let's get our trees. I think we can use them as obstacles. I'm going to select this one and add a box collider to it. And then let's create a tag for them. The tag is going to be called obstacle. So this tree is going to have the obstacle tag and this tree is also going to have the obstacle tag. Okay, now we need to have the player recognize obstacles. We can do this inside on collision enter and check for the following. If collision collider tag equals to obstacle, then we're gonna get our runner and tell it to stop following. This is it. Now let's see what we've done. Bam, we're good. Now if I go to the scene and select the player, we can see that nothing is applied to it anymore. It is just a free rigid body. 
And as soon as I click follow again, it is going to continue following from the same position it collided with the tree at. So we can either reinitialize the lane runner or restart the entire thing by calling level generator restart. But that's the thing for another tutorial. Now what if we don't want to use lanes for our player, but instead have it move freely along the X axis? Like I mentioned, we can do it using the motion module. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove all the components we added, including the lane runner, including the tutorial player, and create a new script, which is going to be called free move player. Okay, and this time what we're going to do is we're going to use the basic runner we already looked at. So let's go to Dream Tech, Forever, Gameplay, and select the basic runner, which is only called runner actually. Now inside the runner we know how to set up the offset, so 1.5. We know how to set up the speed, 20 is enough. And the distance, I'm going to still set it to 50. And now what we need to do is modify this offset property. To do this, we're going to attach our free move player script to the player object, go inside it, and do what we did before. This time, instead of lane runner, I need to reference the runner component. I'm going to add two new properties. One is going to be called, because we're going to move the player with the mouse. And the other one is going to be called move width. This is the length our player is going to travel when moving the mouse. Now let's create a new property of type float and name it input. Now we need to get the mouse input and add it to the input value. I'm going to multiply this by the mouse sensitivity. And then I'm going to clamp the input between minus one and one. Now we need to transfer this input to the runner's motion offset. But before that, we need to have but before that we need to cache the existing runner's offset so that the offset along the y value does not change when we modify the x value. So and then inside start start offset equals to runner motion offset. And now inside update, what we basically need to do is create a new vector from the input which is going to go along the x value. So we use the input to multiply the right vector and we then multiply this by the move scale and multiply it by 0 0.5 because we're going to move in both directions. Now we just need to say runner motion offset equals to start offset plus move vector. If I've done everything correctly, our player should now be controlled by the mouse. And it is. Now the sensitivity is a bit harsh, so I'm going to move it down to 0.05, much better. So yeah, this is it. This is how easy it is to set up a player inside forever and have it controlled. And keep in mind that these two methods I just showed you are not the only ways you can make your player work. You can of course completely ditch the runner scripts and go with your own logic and attach a player projector. So for example, what I can do is turn off this object, move the camera outside, create a new sphere. Add a rigid body and add a projected player component to it. Put it inside a level, hit resume, and now what the projected player is going to do, it is going to look for where the sphere goes. And as soon as the sphere enters a new segment, new segments are going to get generated. And this is how you can create a truly free player without any restrictions. You will always know where the player is along the level using the projected player component but you have your own freedom to create anything in terms of game mechanics. So this is where to get started with the player behaviors in forever. In the next video we are going to talk about custom paths and how we can use them to make our levels more interesting. Thank you for watching, I'm Mitko, thanks for using forever.